Well, hey, Anthem, uh, welcome to whatever this is, uh, wherever you're watching. If you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching with some friends or family, if you're catching this on our website later, whatever it is, so glad you're with us. We're off for a couple of weeks from in-person meetings, uh, but we still wanted to help honestly empower and equip you during this particular season. And so for the next two weeks, uh, today and then uh, next week, Sherry and I are going to be teaching together out of the book of First Peter. And I'll let Sherry intro that in just a minute. But before we get there, I actually just wanted to share a couple of different ways you can connect with Anthem Church and stay in the loop, especially if you are new or newish to our community, or maybe found us online and want to know a little bit more, the absolute best way to take your first step and to get to know us is to text the word Anthem to the number 97000. And when you text that number, you text Anthem to 9700, you'll get an immediate link back that just says, hey, how's it going? And it's got a couple of different links. And so you can uh, fill out our connect card. If you'd like someone to reach out to you, you can learn a little bit more about us. That's just the best way to take um, your first step in getting connected and actually being known. Uh, but also the, the next step after that, the best thing you can do to stay in the loop and to stay connected is to download the Anthem app. It's available in whatever app store you got going on on your phone. Search Anthem Ventura, you'll find it. And there it's going to be the archive of podcasts and media. It's got events. It's got ways to get in touch, way to contact. It's got the group chat for all of our Anthem communities. And it has the weekly guide, which gets updated every single Sunday. It's kind of like a Sunday e-bulletin. And just like the roundup of everything that's happening that week, that is super important. So text that number, download the app store, check out the weekly guide. Uh, but ultimately, I just want to say like, welcome. Like we love you, even if we don't know who's watching. So glad you were taking some time during your holiday break to uh, honestly go to the text, be encouraged, mm -hmm. be stirred. Um, and it's fun to have you. Uh, we thought about filming this in our living room to be like, you know, hey, welcome into our home. <laughs> but just like filming with the kids there was like way too crazy. So we're here at the office in the studio. Uh, and But we want that kind of home vibe to be happening here over the next couple of weeks because what we're talking about today and next week is marriage. Um, and so you wanna kick us off, intro us, where are we at in First Peter? Yes, so uh, we as a church are in First Peter. We took a break in December to do an Advent series, which was incredible with Harvest and Arise. Yeah, that was fun. Which was amazing. We love being able to partner with them in different ways throughout the year. Uh, and then we wanna jump back into First Peter for these next couple of weeks because in January, we will be uh, taking a break for our annual vision series, yeah. which we're super excited about. Yeah. So today we're going to be jumping into First Peter chapter three. So if you've got your Bibles or in your place to get out your Bible or your Bible app, go to First Peter chapter three. Like Sherry said, we're kind of in First Peter. That's taking up the bulk of our fall and our spring, but we've got these breaks for Advent and vision. But we don't want these weeks to go by without um, going to the text with you guys, going to the scriptures. And so we're going to be in First Peter chapter three. And here in this section, Peter is still fleshing out who we are that started up at the beginning of First Peter chapter 2, uh, how we live out that identity of who we are, what we do with that identity, and why we do any of this. And ultimately, the motivation that Peter gave us was Christ, his suffering, going to the cross, and the new life that we do have. And what he's doing, he's been applying that to all of our areas of life. So how we're citizens in whatever country and government we find ourselves in, in our workplace type uh, relationships that we do have. And now the relational circumstances that is so close to home for many of us is is marriage, uh, is husband and wife. And that's where Peter is at today. And, and some of the context for this particular passage is found in um, the last part of chapter 2 where Peter calls us, no matter the circumstance, um, whatever the context we're in, to demonstrate the power of the gospel by serving others, right? And so that's the lens in which we come to this spot in 1 Peter. We don't come primary to the lens of how do I get mine or how can I justify my position or how can I get what I want, but we come to the text according to 1 Peter with this lens of how can I serve others, how can I be great in the workplace, a great citizen? How can I be great in a marriage? How can I come with actually a posture of submission and service? That's a context for how we are entering into chapter three because it lands in such a huge way in what we're talking about here in 1 Peter 3. Now, before we go any further, 
because I already said the M word, marriage. We want to recognize that many of you guys that are watching are actually not married yet. Maybe you've been married before. Maybe you hope or uh, kind of are looking towards marriage in the future. Maybe some of you are married. Maybe it's a great marriage. Maybe it's an awful marriage. We just know there's tons of different situations and circumstances uh, for people in our church and even the people who are going to be watching this outside our church. And so today, if you're married, the application may be super obvious uh, for you. But if you are not yet married or looking towards marriage in the future, this is an opportunity to just grow as a human. Uh, to grow as a human, to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in a romantic context or in a marital context, but also just like as a human. There are good principles here. So if you're not yet married, stick with us. I trust that scripture is going to speak to you no matter what your circumstance is. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, there are two primary uh, teachings on marriages. One to husbands, one to wives. And today, what we're going to start is where Peter starts. We're going to go ladies first, talking wives. So Sherry's going to read the text, and then we're going to go back and forth, just making some comments, observations, maybe asking questions of each other, having some conversation. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. We're kind of winging some of this, but <laughs> go ahead. You got right. First Peter chapter 3. You just read the whole text, 1 through 7, and we'll kind of go back and look Perfect. at different parts of it. All right, so chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very, very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to, adore, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Well done. All right. So uh, that text freaked a bunch of you guys out. Don't worry. We're going to unpack it over this week and next week. We're going to take some of that dicey stuff and try to understand what it means for us today. But there are some contextual things right off the bat that will be helpful as we look into Peter's words. The first thing is that he's writing primarily to a Gentile audience or a non-Jewish audience here. And the Gentile audience in the Roman Empire, all right? So while beliefs about women varied from area to area and time and place, uh, spoiler alert, most often in history, they're not great. Uh, but in general, the, the view of women was fairly low in most of the cultures uh, that Peter is writing to here. And the Bible actually, in its time and its place, was quite revolutionary in how it paved the way for an entirely new view of women as made in the image of God. And, and like Sherry read in, in verse 7, like co-equal heirs, that was like incendiary, revolutionary language as Peter is writing, that women are just like men, gifted and empowered to serve the mission of God, not as second-class citizens or worse, but actually created equal and so one of these texts that we have is like 1 Peter 3, where if we come in and we don't understand how the Bible was uplifting women, we have some strange views about what is happening here. And so what we find in 1 Peter chapter 3 is a beautiful uplifting of women, but also Peter talking about the interplay of man and woman, husband and wife in the marital context. So the other contextual thing here is while I said earlier there are lessons for single folks or people who are not yet married, when Peter or Paul talks about the relationship of wives and husbands, he does not speak at large about how men and women should relate. So when he says wives, he means wives. He doesn't mean all women everywhere have to follow this advice. He's talking inside the marital context is what he's getting at here. So with some of that context here, first, uh, first instruction from Peter here in the text in verses 1 and 2 is talking to wives that have unbelieving husbands. So likewise, wives. So likewise, by the way, connecting to what he's already said about how we should all be serving one another. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, aka do not yet follow Jesus, they might be one without a word 
by the conduct of their wives. Once again, talking about honorable contact in the sight of those who don't believe. It's a repeat of what he's already done in 1 Peter chapter 2, where he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, honorable. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, they will be won over. So likewise, in the same way he's just talked to the servants and he's talked about how we live in the country and context that we're in, he says, I want to talk to you gals, married wives who are sitting here particularly in marriages with husbands who do not yet follow Jesus. And his language here that is problematic for many, but we're going to get there, is be subject to your own husbands. Now, in some translations, it might say submit to your own husbands. And that language may be causing a bunch of you to panic and have like the night sweats immediately as you sit there and read that. <laughs> Others of you, it may be like totally norm. But this idea of submission in the Bible has created a number of cultural challenges. Uh, first and foremost, that it gets used and abused in all the wrong ways. I'll get to there in a minute. But Peter's instruction here is not meant to further an inappropriate and damaging Roman hierarchical structure in the household, but rather he's hoping that no matter what the context and structure of society is, he wants the gospel to advance. So Peter's not sitting here trying to rewrite Roman marriage hierarchical structure. He's saying, whatever context you're in, here's how the gospel can go forward. That's the real point here. We miss the point when we actually ask those questions like, wait a second, why isn't Peter trying to like upend Roman marriages as we know it? He's like, that's not his point. His point is the gospel first and foremost. And if the gospel goes forward, it has all kinds of implications into every area of society and life. But first and foremost is the kingdom and the gospel. And he's saying that the way that a godly wife can advance the gospel in no matter her context, even with an unbelieving husband, mind you, is to continue to serve him in the order of the day, quote, unquote. And so the submission which Peter is talking about is not adherence to a principle per se, but it's recognition of the person who compels us to submit no matter our circumstances, right? In order to live these lives of godly obedience, in all three cases in 1 Peter chapter 2 and 3 where he's talking about submission or be subject. So he says to human institutions, slaves to masters, wives to husbands, and all of these contexts here, the overriding principle is Christians are to present themselves before a watching world as people who emulate Jesus, as people who sacrifice like Jesus. We are to pattern our lives on his example. And in doing so, we present the world with a fresh and vibrant picture of this living hope Peter's talked about in chapter one. And so for generations, there have been many challenging experiences with this particular passage. And it all stems from typically men or husbands using it as a quote unquote biblical basis for demanding that their wife submit to him no matter what. That would be a wildly inappropriate and damaging read and use of this particular passage. And as with each of the husband-wife passages that we see in scriptures, like in Ephesians and Colossians and here in 1 Peter, the call is for each spouse to take responsibility for his or her own expression of godliness within the marriage. That's what all the biblical writers are trying to get at. With the, with the priority of advancing the gospel, say you, no matter your marital context here, your priority is to advance the gospel and to be an expression of godliness within the marriage. It's not your job to fix the other person. It's your job to approach with godliness, to approach with humble sacrifice, to approach with unconditional love. And Peter's hope for wives who have husbands who don't believe, that's the context here, that they would actually live in a way, and he describes this as quiet and faithful, this expression of Jesus within the marriage, rather than freeing themselves from that marriage because the husband chooses not to believe, that actually be won over by their conduct. And so he wants us to see marriage through like a missional, uh, he wants like a gospel centrality lens as a, we are all trying to emulate Jesus to a watching world and with a missional lens. So gospel, emulate Jesus and missional lens all within these couple of two verses here. He's saying that you have a chance to demonstrate the power of God to the person you are closest with. So advance the gospel, emulate Jesus, 
see your marriage through a missional lens. But he expounds on that and he talks a little bit about the how in the next couple of verses. Yeah, so he gives some of the how for the wives. And in 1 Peter, um, so in chapter 3, verse 3, he talks about don't let your adorning be external, um, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet mm. spirit, which in God's sight is very, very precious. That's worth, like, I just, I'm looking at that right in front of me. It's worth noting, like, the external things change, yeah. right? The internal things are imperishable. Right. So good. Yeah, it's like you marry someone and looks change, styles change, but the internal beauty is something that uh, will hopefully change for good. It's uh, emulating who God is, and you can show Jesus to your spouse, yeah. which, which I love. But We've been married seven and a half years now. Yeah. We've changed quite a bit. Yeah. Our looks have changed quite a bit. Shares a blonde now. <laughs> I used to wear other colors when we got married. Yes, many Those other colors. external things change. But like what's hoping is that as we're investing not only in each other, but in ourselves and in the internal, like imperishable beauty that is there in both of mm -hmm. us, we actually grow to become more like Jesus. And we actually end up helping each other become more like Jesus. Yeah. So wives, we want to demonstrate the gospel to our husbands. Um, we have been women who have been um, born again into a living hope through the resurrection of the dead. And we carry something that is deeper and more pure than anything that's externally represented. And so you can, you know, wear clothes that you want and you can wear jewelry and braid your hair. That's not what this is saying. But the thing that's always going to be there is your internal beauty. And so that's what we need to be focusing on. Um, and so Peter is not bringing instruction about what is, is allowed and what's not allowed. Yeah, it's not really the point here. Yeah, yeah. that's not the point. And it's more of a missional approach to mm -hmm. dem demonstrating um, Jesus to your husband. Yeah. And remember the context, particularly wives with unbelieving husbands. Mm -hmm. That's still the context here. This applies to wives in any sort of context. But remember, he's thinking about wives who are married to husbands okay. that are not yet believers in Jesus. Right. Yeah. So uh, the instructions to a wife about how to adorn herself are given as self-governed and are given as self-governed imperatives, meaning Peter's goal is not to create an, an enforceable law within the church, but rather giving instructions on how we can live in light of Christ and yeah. how we've been um, changed because we have Jesus, we have the living hope um, with us. Yeah. So, and oh, one thing that we love is the NASB version adds the word merely to the commands. So do not let your adorning be merely external. Like, uh, don't even worry like, about that. Forget about about it. Yeah. Like, come on, not a big deal. Yeah. Right. So I love that. It's just showing the emphasis that Peter's writing, yeah. um, just how unimportant the external beauty is. Yeah. So um, again, the Bible doesn't seem to command women to dress plainly either. Um, in Proverbs 31, it says she makes coverings for herself or bed coverings for herself and her clothing is fine linen and purple. So the invitation is for women to consider that she's been born into a new way. Fine linen. Fine like linens. Like yeah, that. that's what I want for Christmas. Fine, <laughs> Fine linens. linens. Uh, so, she, so she operates from a different source and foundation than yeah. the women of the Roman Empire that have no spirit of Christ in them. Because of that, they are free to present a different depth to their husbands in the hopes of winning them over to the gospel. And so... Uh, if you are married to an unbelieving husband, wives, you don't need to be shoving um, the gospel or Jesus down his throat. You don't need to be like waving banners all over the place, but like who you are inside is going to be like leeching out of you in a way that is so beautiful. And it's like an essence that your husband will notice. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's the encouragement here is that... Um, just the, the quiet, gentle spirit of Jesus is working in you. Yeah. And so keep, keep doing those things. Yeah. And then like Peter has said before, like the world is watching. So this is where one of those moments where this applies everywhere all the time. Like we all know those people in life who like just like life comes out. It leaks out of them. Like wholeness leaks out of them. Peace leaks out of them. We're like, ah, I want that. That seems appealing. That seems It seems like something I want. And in the same way, Peter is telling wives, like, let your conduct, like, win your unbelieving husband over 
in the same way all of us, like that's how we want to win people over. Like no one ever comes to Christ because they lose an argument with somebody, right. you know, but they will come and, and come into contact with Christ because they see the conduct of the lives of believers and go, that's actually better. I actually yeah. want that in life. So what Peter's been doing so far is he says, okay, here's, here's what we're talking about here, wives. Walk in this kind of otherworldly, Christ-like submission to your husbands. And, and even though they're unbelieving, win them over with your internal imperishable beauty. Not the external stuff that's going to change much, but that internal thing, the real beauty that's there. And then he goes to the Bible for model here. He goes as an example to Sarah. He shares the imperishable beauty of this gentle, quiet spirit is precious in God's sight. And you back to the purpose here. Peter's not trying to create a new law. He's not saying you got to dress like this. Missing the point, if that's what you're reading in this section. It's like Sari said, self-governed imperatives. Like, how am I thinking about how I can best represent Christ in any situation? But he's sharing how... Um, the Spirit of God shapes our responses in, in what could be really difficult situations. And he goes to Sarah as an example. So he doesn't simply give instruction and motivation. He gives examples here for women. And in 1 Peter 3, 5, and 6, he says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, capital, or you know, lowercase l, not capital L there. Uh, as you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So Peter uses Sarah and Abraham as examples of this. If you know the story of Sarah and Abraham, they had their fair share of trials here. Life was not super easy. On two different occasions, Abraham put Sarah in these really compromising situations in Genesis 12 and Genesis 20. And in both instances, Sarah trusted the Lord and went along with Abraham's plan. But that's not it. Because our culture is trying to constantly make women think that applying this kind of principle will end up as a setback for women anywhere and everywhere. When that's not true of Sarah at all. Because Peter says, no, 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 look at Sarah. Look what she, she got in her husband's face too. Like there is this partnership in marriage that is something to be emulated and, and modeled after. And God sees and values the, the challenging positions of a wife with an unbelieving husband. And it's kind of a weird moment to think of Abraham as an unbelieving husband in this moment, but this is how kind of Peter casts him in this light. And the emphasis on the story here is actually on Sarah, not really on Abraham, and how she displayed the glory and beauty of God in that moment. So Peter's using this example from the Old Testament to give women an opportunity to see what adorning themselves with a gentle and quiet spirit can produce. And that doesn't mean being quiet and sitting in a corner, right? It means this partnership that we're talking about with the husband. Now, here's the deal. With these couple of verses that we've dug into so far, one of the greatest realities of the gospel is that it impacts every area of our lives. Peter dives directly into the home life, the, the most intimate space the gospel can be touching. And he challenges them to live a life of submission. We're going to get into this next week, but Peter starts his instruction to husbands with the word likewise again, mm -hmm. which is basically Peter's way of saying, everything we've kind of said about the wives so far, husbands, you need to learn from that as well. You're not exempt from all of these things. You need to walk <laughs> in the same way too. So we're just talking about the wives Say so We're going to get to the husbands next yeah. week. But it, what Peter's been doing so far is as he dives into this space, He's challenging them to a life of submission to each other, to human institutions, as he said in chapter two, to the world we find ourselves in. And it's the defining characteristic of marriage throughout scripture is submitting to one another. It's preferring one another. It's sacrificing for each other. And as Peter has said in previous sections, being a follower of Jesus affects our lives every part of our lives, in, in politics, as citizens, in our work and vocation, and now in our marriage, in our relational life. And so the big question for husbands and wives to be asking themselves is whether the way I'm living, whether the way I'm living right now, whether you're married to an unbeliever or not, whether you're actually married or not, what, how am I living? And is how I am living pointing 
here in this text, my spouse towards Jesus, or more generically, how I live in pointing others toward Jesus, or, or not. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And for wives specifically, question, how, have I shown honor, submission, and inner beauty as the defining realities of my married life? Have, have I been living in a way that shows Jesus to my husband? Yeah. So it's like, these are good questions to yeah. just be asking yourself. You can talk to your spouse about them after yeah. you've maybe had time to think about them. You know, if you have some time after the kids are in bed, if you have kids, but um, just have some conversation around these things. Yeah. These are really critical questions to be processing. And so today we're talking wives. And so as, as the wife, am I living in a way that points my, my husband to Jesus? Am, yeah. am I showing that honor, that submission, that inner beauty is the defining realities of my married life? These are critical quest- questions to be answering that every believing spouse should be asking and answering. And it should be shaping, not shaming, but shaping our lives. There's no shame built into these yeah. passages, but it is an opportunity to walk in greater faithfulness when we take on what Peter is talking about here and actually live in a way that demonstrates Christ to our spouse. And the reality is we can only do this because Christ has gone before us, Mm -hmm. leading the way in what sacrifice looks like. He's gone before us, sacrificing himself for you and I. And through his sacrifice, we have life. Like through sacrifice, we have life and we can live the way he would live if he were us. And so we ask these, uh, or we kind of put before you these realities of following Jesus all the time of to be a disciple means to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and to do what he would do. And sometimes I add the addendum, do what he would do if he were you. Right, and so if Jesus were, you know, 35 and married, uh, if Jesus were working at a tech startup company, if he were a freelance graphic designer, if he were a single person, uh, like if he were in my context, my person, my personality, what would he do? Yeah, and that is a great question to be asking on the tail end of of this section. Yeah, it's like, what would he be doing? And so you ask yourself, are you living a life that points people to Jesus? Yeah. And that's ultimately what Peter's getting at here. Are we living our life in a way that points our spouse to Jesus? Is the gospel our primary motivation? And are we submitting to each other and sacrificing for each other? So we actually want to pray a blessing over you guys um, that are watching here today. And once again, we split this passage up into two parts. So today we were talking mostly around wives. Next week, we're going to grill the husbands. Uh, so that's what's, that's what's on. But we'd love to pray for you, pray blessing. And then we've just got a few things to share after that. So do you want to pray? Yeah. Go for it. Pray, uh, maybe like pray for our wives, Perfect. like specifically. I'm on it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Heavenly Father, um, so grateful uh, for just the living hope that we have because of your son, Jesus. And I thank you uh, for all the wives um, who are watching this, all the wives in our church at Anthem. God, would we um, focus on the inner beauty that's imperishable, Jesus, because you have changed us and we have your power that lives within us. Would we live in such a way that glorifies you and honors you? Would we live in a way that honors our husbands? God, would we, um, would we just seek to know you more? Would we seek to um, just find ways where we can serve our husbands even better? Um, but God, I'm thankful for your word that we can learn from it. Thank you that Peter wrote this um, so many thousands of years ago. Um, yeah, Jesus, we're just grateful. Thank you um, just for this opportunity for Bert and I to be here this morning. I just pray blessing over the wives and a blessing over all the women, God, in our church. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Before we jet out here, thank you again for being with us today, whenever and wherever you're watching. Stoked that you're here. Um, Kind of no matter what our context is, and this has been a fairly strange year. Am I right? So no matter what our context is, we always want to go to the text, let it shape our life, and then respond in a way that honors Jesus. And so some of how we respond is by worshiping. So we sing. And even though we're not singing together this morning, you can find on Spotify our Anthem Worship playlist. You can take some worship moments as a family on your own today. 
We also respond by giving and giving generously. Uh, you guys have been crazy generous in a crazy, very confusing, very chaotic year. I want to thank yeah. you for your generosity and encourage you the way Paul does, the Philippians, like it's the fruit to your credit. Like God is building a faith and trust story in you every time you step out in those moments yes. to give. We also respond uh, in communion. And so uh, since we are not taking communion together right now over the video, if you are with anybody watching this, take a few moments, receive communion together, mm -hmm. and we respond by prayer. So the best way, if you'd like to get prayer, you can chat us up in the group chat, or you can text the number 805-516-0010. We'd love to be praying mm -hmm. for you. So once again, thanks for being with us. Yeah. Hope this is helpful, encouraging, equipping, useful. We're excited to be back with you next week. Yes, we love you guys. We yeah. hope you had a great Christmas. Yeah, hope you had a really good Christmas. And we'll see you in the new year. Yes, happy Bye, new year. Bye.